when I say the words criminal organizations in anime, the first things that come to your mind are probably the Akatsuki and the Phantom Troop. A group of loose bandits brought together under the power of an incredibly powerful and charismatic leader. Men and women brought together through a shared belief or the desire for money. And this is a trope as old as time. For as long as there's been good guys, there's been bad guys to team up against said good guys. But today we're not going to be talking about the Akatsuki or even the Phantom Troop. Though we will be talking about an organization or a family that exists within Hunter x Hunter. You see, when people talk about criminal organizations in Hunter x Hunter, obviously the first thing that comes to your mind is the Phantom Troop. But the Phantom Troop aren't even the strongest group of criminals in Hunter x Hunter. That would be the Zoldic family. A family of assassins so powerful that everybody on Earth knows their name. Given a mountain to live on by one of the biggest countries in Hunter x Hunter because they don't want the smoke. A family of highly trained, bloodthirsty assassins with no other allegiances outside of money. And yet, while they are one of the coolest presences in Hunter x Hunter, we don't know a huge amount about them. So who is every single member of the Zoldic family? What are their abilities? And who's the strongest? We're going to answer all of that and more in just one second, guys. But please, for me. Like this video, subscribe to the page, and hit that noti bell. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank every single one of you that clicked to watch today's video. When I made this page, I was incredibly frightened that the only thing that YouTube would ever want to hear me talk about was Naruto. By clicking this video, by following this page, by hitting that noti bell, you are supporting me and doing something that I really, really want to do. So once again, Thank you. So the Zoldics, while they may be a family, that doesn't mean all of them are very similar. In fact, the majority of the Zoldics have very different abilities and very different personalities. Well, some parts of their personalities are different because at the core of every single Zoldic family member, there is a killer, a man or a woman who will not blink an eye at ending your life. And that sentiment is with every single Zoldic member, regardless of their strength. You could say it's actually especially present in the weaker Zoldics, like our weakest Zoldic, Miluki. You see, Miluki is the second eldest son of Silva, and what he lacks in physical strength, he makes up for in murderous intent, intelligence, and also commitment to his family. You see, because the first time that we ever even see Miluki Zoldic, he's torturing Kilawa for leaving the family and injuring their mother. And he's furious with Kilawa because Kilawa is acting rebelliously against the family and their greater wishes. However, just because he's blindly loyal and very evil does not mean he can necessarily injure Kilawa. You see, Maluki is not powerful like the rest of the family. He has no superhuman strength or superhuman nen ability. In fact, he struggles to even run small distances. For a standard person, he is incredibly out of shape. That means for the Zoldic family, he's basically an ant. But if this family is so filled to the gills with murderer that'll kill anybody at the blink of an eye, why do they deal with him? Well, Maluki is the only tech savvy person in the entirety of the Zoldic family. That is to say, he's the only person who truly understands how technology works and how to apply it to assassination work. See, the Zoldic family has been around for a long time, like a very, very long time and we'll talk about that in a second but as time progresses so do the things around people like technology and maluki realizing that he wasn't very physically strong spent a lot of time on the computer and therefore actually became the zoldic's connection to conventional technology being able to make them assassination weapons or even just get them assassination jobs also with the use of his technological experience he's able to keep a finger on the pulse of the world tapping into things like the york new city auction or the hunter's database but he's more useful than just the google Google search. He's also an incredibly proficient hacker, being able to steal information from any sort of database as long as it exists online. And this is truly the only reason that Silva, Zeno, and Kikyo deal with him. Because if he was a Zoldic who was utterly useless, they would have killed him without a second thought. I mean, Maluki was literally able to recreate the entirety of Greed Island as a game based off a save data given to him by Kilowa. And this is with little to no mastery of Nen, which Greed Island was created with. On top of that, he's an incredibly talented inventor, being able to create a micro-sized bomb to be placed on the back of a mosquito that when it bites its intended target, it explodes and kills them ideally. Except for the fact that you can't direct a mosquito at a target and also the bomb was only as powerful as a firecracker. But then again, this bomb was small enough to go on the back of a mosquito. So being able to make it as strong as a firecracker is saying something. When it comes to Nen, Maluki is a manipulator, though we've never technically ever seen him use his Nen abilities. Now this is most likely due in fact to one of two things. The fact that he hasn't left the house in decades 
or the fact that he's not that strong in Nen and therefore doesn't really have any abilities to show off. However, we do know that he's awakened to Nen because he's able to see Nanika's Nen when she's healing Gon. But since we're talking about people whose Nen abilities we don't really know, next up we have Kikyo. Now, Kikyo is the matriarch of the Silver family, Silva's wife. But don't let her role as a housewife or a mother make you think that she's not an assassin. She absolutely is. But Kikyo's upbringing is a bit different from the rest of the Zoldic family members. You see, Kikyo was actually born in Meteor City, the place where the majority of the members of the Phantom Troop came from and where Canary came from. Meteor City is considered a dumping ground in the Hunter Hunter universe, a place where you can throw anything that you don't want, be that trash, old furniture, or humans. And because of the lawless nature of this area, if you don't become strong quickly, well, you die. Now, as to how Kikyo and Silva met, we technically don't know. We just learned that Kikyo is from Meteor City in a data book, and I also think Goto might have mentioned it once. And this growing up in Meteor City is probably what formed her into the person that she is today. A maniacal assassin who loves the majority of her kids more than anything on Earth, but specifically Kilua. Kikyo is absolutely obsessed with her youngest son, so much so that she pushes anybody who ever gets near him away from him so she can have him for herself. And unfortunately, Kikyo's love for the world pretty much runs out with Kilua, as we've seen her use innocent people as test subjects for Aluka's abilities. We once saw Kikyo demand that Mitsubo, one of their old helpers, make sure to say no to any request Aluka makes. Fully understanding that by saying no to Aluka's request that Mitsubo would most likely die. And in fact, Mitsubo did die. Both her and her lover Hassam were squished. But hey, at least from that, Kikyo is able to determine that if you say no to Aluka's requests four times, you get squished. But Kikyo is also the matriarch of a family of assassins, which means she wants all of her children to be assassins, specifically Kilua, which is why she gets so happy when Kilua acts like an assassin and is cold towards her, which is why she was excited that Kilua stabbed her. As far as her abilities, we don't know a huge amount about them. This is largely this is largely due to the fact that she was born in Meteor City, where no records are kept. The only time we've ever really seen her in pseudo combat is when she knocked out Canary, but she did that just by firing a projectile from her fan. We don't know if that's tied into her ability at all. We do know that just like the last person on this list though, her Nen type is manipulation, which makes sense because she's been trying to do that to Kilua for years. Fortunately for us, Kikyo is the last person on this list whose abilities we don't fully understand. Because next up we have Kaluto. Kaluto, Kaluto. I'm gonna go with Kaluto. You see, Kaluto is the youngest member of the Zoldic family currently. In that they, and I'm gonna use they, them pronouns for Kaluto because we don't necessarily know whether or not they are a man or a woman. For reference on this, Alaka is a transgender woman. And Kaluto will be being born a man does wear a kimono of a woman, so it might be the same circumstance as Alaka. So they, to be polite. Kalito, to me at least, is one of the most interesting members of the Zoldic family. Critically underexplained, critically misunderstood, and critically not around enough. Kalito is the only member of the Zoldics to ever enter the Phantom Troop. They joined the Phantom Troop to replace Hisoka and thus became the number four member of the Phantom Troop. Now, mind you, they are younger than Kilowa, who is around 13 years old during the timeline of Hunter x Hunter. That is to say that Kalito is most likely somewhere in the range of 10 years old and was strong enough to join the Phantom Troop. And while admittedly, Kalito is not one of the stronger members of the Phantom Troop, just joining is enough. Kalito is incredibly faithful to the Zoldic family, almost constantly being seen clutching onto the side of Kikyo. And unfortunately from Kikyo, they picked up a side of sadism. A side of sadism that makes them drag out fights against weaker opponents so they can torture them. But can we necessarily be surprised by this? Before they even joined the Phantom Troop, they accompanied Illumi and Maha in the assassination of the Ten Dawns. Ten Mafia crime bosses who would put massive bounties on the Phantom Troop's heads. So at the age of 10, not only were they assassinating the hunters that were protecting the 10 Dons, they were also killing incredibly high-level, very important mafiosos. However, it wasn't until they joined the Phantom Troop that we truly got to see their abilities. See, Kalito was actually probably the most talented user of Zetsu in the entire Zoldic family. They were able to spy on Gon Karapika and Leorio completely unnoticed, but they were also able to appear before Bonolinov and Franklin completely unnoticed, distracted them for a couple of seconds and then disappear, essentially showing that they could elude the Phantom Troop if they wanted. Something Gon and Kilua couldn't do against weaker members of the Phantom Troop, mind you. In fact, the only person who's ever been able to pick up on Kaluto Zetsu was Hisoka, who's arguably top five strongest people in Hunter x Hunter. Their Zetsu is so complete that Kaluto was able to keep surveillance on Phantom Troop members 
in the Zazan Palace in Meteor City without the Phantom Troop members noticing. In order to accomplish this, Kalato used their Nen ability surveillance paper dolls, where essentially Kalato, as a manipulator, can place a piece of confetti on a person they want to observe. And then after creating a paper doll of that person, they can hear what's ever happening around the person they've made the paper doll of. And the stealth of this technique is so absolute, people like Phaeton didn't know it was being used on them. But if you do push Kalato into a fight, they also have incredibly powerful offensive techniques. Outside of the fact that Kalato carries a fan with them that is able to cut through steel rope, they also have an ability called Dance of the Serpent's Bite. This technique also uses confetti. And essentially by making a massive wind current with their fan, Kalato creates a tunnel of confetti in a tornado-like shape that can pull people to pieces. Imagine Byaki Akuchiki's Bankai and the way that it creates a million blades that slice you to death slowly and painfully. This is essentially a tornado of paper cuts, but paper that can cut through steel. And it's actually implied on top of all of this in Greed Island that the Phantom Troop wouldn't have been able to find the Nen Exorcist without Kalato, thus implying that Kalato has some kind of extrasensory perception that allows them to find whoever they're looking for. Now, this next entry on the list is going to make a couple of people upset. And I'd like to say that this next entry on the list is made with a big old caveat. You see, because the next entry on our list is Kilowa. Yeah, he's fourth from the bottom in terms of strength of all those old things that we know. But the big caveat here, because I can already hear people screaming it in the back, is that this is his strength without the help of Alika slash Nanika. But Nick, with the power of Alika and Nanika, he can basically achieve anything he wants because he can make her do whatever he wants. Yes, I'm aware that technically he's like boundless with Alika and Nanika's help. But we're talking about his strength. And well, obviously the way that he treated Alika and Nanika is a big part of his personality and therefore could be considered part of his strength. It's too not concrete. So just based off of Kilowa's strength, experiences, abilities, all of that, he's right here on the list. See, Kilowa is our first and probably only entry on the list of people who don't really buy into the Zoldic family. You see, because a big part of being in the Zoldic family is believing that the Zoldic family is the most important entity on Earth. However, because Kilowa doesn't really buy into the whole family aspect, he abandons the family after stabbing his mother and goes to become a hunter. And if he was to be hypothetically successful in this endeavor of becoming a hunter, he would have been the sort of first Zoldic family member to become a hunter. Obviously, sort of first because Illumi was taking the test with him. But just because Kilua isn't as faithful to the Zoldic family as everyone else does not mean that he didn't pick up on the whole sadism murderous side. You see, because on a surface level, Kilua seems like a happy-go-lucky kind of kid. The kind of kid who spent $200 million on chocolate. When it boils down to it, he is as Zoldic as anybody else, being able to tap into an almost bottomless well of murderous rage. And while we technically, as the show progresses, see less and less of this murderous rage, Kilua is never afraid to tap into it. Like during the hunter exam when he ripped a man's heart out of his chest, placed it in a bag, and then handed it back to him. Or like during the Heaven's Arena arc when he threatened to murder the three people on level 200 that were threatening Gon. See, Kilua as a co-antagonist of the show is meant to act as a foil to Gon. And as Kilo becomes more and more of a human, Gon is supposed to descend further and further into darkness. And that's truly what I believe everyone loves about Kilowa as a whole. And we'll do a you know nothing about Kilowa at some point. But more than just the darkness, Kilowa also has to confront his fear of fighting people stronger than him. You see, Kilo is one of the very few non-manipulators in the Zoldic fam, being a transmuter himself. However, his older brother Illumi is a manipulator and has the ability to brainwash people by putting a needle in their brain. And therefore, more than overcoming the darkness in his heart, Kilo also had to confront the manipulation and brain control that Illumi had him under to make sure that he never entered a battle he couldn't absolutely win. And it wasn't until the Chimera Ant arc that Kilo finally underwent this battle, into one. And once Kilowa undoes this brainwashing, his abilities get maxed out. You see, Kilowa is a Zoldic through and through, which means that he was raised to be an assassin from the second he was born. Which means that even without the use of Nen, he had insane strength, speed, durability, and resistances to things like electricity and poison. In fact, before Kilowa even learned Nen, he was able to open four out of the seven testing gates at the Zoldic compound. That is to say, he pushed aside 16 tons. Wait, no, sorry. I thought that the first door weighed two tons, not four. It's actually only the third door. Four, eight, 16, 30, 
32, 64, which is what Kilua opened after he learned Nen. And speaking of things that Kilua did before Nen, he was able to rip out Jonas's heart, the serial killer, from the hunter exam so quickly that the serial killer didn't even realize that the heart had been pulled out. That was all before Kilua learned Nen. See, the beauty of Hunter Hunter is that Togashi gives us actual numbers to people's speed and strength. We basically have a number to understand Kilua's speed. See, Kilua is fast enough to dodge a bullet, as long as said bullet is fired at least 57 meters away from Kilua. 57 centimeters is just shy of two feet. And this isn't even just some average bullet. This is a high velocity bullet. So Kilua's perception is speed is so fast that he can see a bullet being fired at him from two feet away and dodge it. And this speed has helped him to accomplish innumerable feats, like the fact that he knocked out 1,400 hunter examinees in less than 45 minutes. In fact, he knocked out all of these examinees so quickly, he said it took him longer to collect their badges than anything else. Lucky for these wannabe hunters, Kilua didn't even use the majority of his techniques. See, there's an ability passed down through certain members of the Zoldic family. The ability to manipulate your body, that is the ability to change your hand, into a weapon. See, Kilua has passed down the ability to make his nails sharper than knives. That's only if Kilua actually wants you to see him coming. See, the only time that we've actually ever technically heard Kilua's footsteps is when Gon was Jaja Kenning Pito into oblivion. That's actually real. Go back and watch Hunter Hunter. You'll never hear Kilua's steps until he's running after Gon. On top of that, Kilua has access to the ability Rhythm Echo, which allows him to walk at such a pace that he leaves physical after images of himself so you don't know which one is attacking. And like I said earlier, amongst the Zoldix, he's actually kind of rare because he's not a manipulator, he's a transmuter, which means his techniques revolve around changing the shape and properties of his aura. In his circumstance, it's a lightning. But when it comes to Nen, Kilua is a genius. And not even just a genius, a genius amongst geniuses. You see, when Kilua went to the dodgeball game on Greed Island, Bisky said that he was able to redistribute his aura with a 1% margin of error. That is to say that he could use Ryu almost perfectly. Ryu, for those of you who haven't seen my Nen Explain video, is the process of using Gyo and Ken simultaneously. Gyo meaning that you concentrate your aura in a singular place, and Ken being an upgraded version of Ten, aka a defensive shrouding of Nen around your entire body. Bisky, who is a one-star hunter, mind you, said that she did not accomplish this ability until she was late in her 20s. But we're not going to talk about Ryu when it comes to keeping Kilua, we have to talk about his lightning abilities. See, when Kilua transmutes his aura into lightning, he can use it in multiple different kinds of ways. He can use Lightning Palm, which coats his palms in lightning that he uses to shock his opponent. He can use Thunderbolt, which combines transmutation with emission as he throws a Thunderbolt at his opponent. But even that isn't what we really want to talk about, right? We want to talk about Godspeed. Well, Godspeed has two applications whirlwind in speed of lightning first we're going to talk about whirlwind because i believe it to be the more interesting of the two applications see let's say hypothetically you throw a tennis ball at me there's a couple of things i could do in this circumstance i could dodge the tennis ball or i could catch the tennis ball and if i fail to do either of those things i'll take a tennis ball straight to the face now in order to do either of those things a couple things need to happen one i need to see the tennis ball two my brain needs to tell my nerves to tell my muscles to move in order to either catch this ball or dodge this ball. And that entire processes of things happening takes time. Time that could result in a tennis ball hurtling into my face. Now imagine we're not talking about tennis balls. We're talking about bullets. You don't really have a lot of time and you really don't want that bullet to the face. Kilua cuts this time out by cloaking his entire body in his lightning aura. That is to say that he instructs his aura to automatically react to outside stimuli. And since the lightning that covers his body acts as a neural pathway, it can move his muscles without his brain having to step in. Meaning that technically he doesn't have to see or even register anything around him. His body will simply just react to external stimuli and move on its own. And since Kilua's aura is programmable, he can program it to react to certain different things. And because conditional Nen becomes even stronger, by programming his Nen to react to things specific to a certain person gives Kilua an even further boost in speed. Which is why he was able to strike Yupi one of the royal guards multiple times without Yupi really having anything to do about it. Technically being able to give an order to Nen is a manipulation ability, so Whirlwind actually could be used in thanks 
to Kilua being a Zoldic. The second ability of Godspeed is Speed of Lightning. And while this makes some people believe that Kilua moves at the speed of lightning, unfortunately that's just not true. We know that Kilua covered a distance of 40 kilometers in 10 minutes, meaning that through very bad terrain, albeit he moved at 240 kilometers per hour about 150 miles per hour. Now, if he was on better terrain, like a paved road or just an open flat salt basin, he could probably move faster than this. People highball him at around 500 miles per hour, which is just drastically slower than lightning. And for that reason and that reason alone, Kilua is this low on the list. After Kilua is his older brother and one of my least favorite characters in the entirety of Hunter x Hunter, Illumi. You see, Illumi truly lives up to the manipulator Nen type. Oh, I'm dumb. Earlier I said Kalato was the only member who joined the Phantom Troop. Illumi obviously replaces Ugovin. Illumi is the oldest child of Silva and Kikyo. And he, like many other members on this list, is very proud of his Zoldic family. So much so that he played a very active part in the raising of Kilua into an elite assassin. And because Illumi is so aware of Kilua's potential, Illumi is very invested in Kilua becoming the best assassin he can be. This is something that Silva, Kilua, and Illumi's father is also very aware of. Therefore, for Silva actually directed Illumi to place a Nen Needle in Kilua's brain while he was young, making sure that he would flee from any battle he knew he could not win, thus guaranteeing Kilua's safety. Illumi is the physical representation of being your brother's keeper, because not only was he tasked with the task of making sure that Kilua would never fight anybody stronger than him, after Kilua flees the Zoldic Mansion, Illumi is sent to keep an eye on him in the Hunter exam, and Illumi is able to do this because of his Nen ability. See, Illumi's Nen ability revolves entirely around needles, specifically three different sets of needles that once imbued with Nen act differently. See, Lumi's first set of needles when imbued with Nen can change his or somebody else's appearance. Simply by placing these needles imbued with Nen into certain places in his or somebody else's body, it can change how they look entirely. New height, new bone structure, everything. Illumi's second set of needles is the needle that he used to brainwash Kilowa. It's a thinner needle that when placed in somebody's brain can set a predetermined condition, like don't fight people stronger than you. And Illumi's third set of needle is the needle that he uses to create needle people. These needles, when placed in the skull of a person, allow Illumi to control them. Essentially, if Illumi gets this needle in your skull, he gets to control you like a person playing an RPG. But Illumi doesn't even need to resort to the use of his needles half of the time he's in combat. See, when Illumi was sent to dispatch of the Ten Dawns, there was 40 hunters there protecting the Ten Dawns. Illumi killed all of them before they could even ask for help. And even if you do get your hands on Illumi, Gon quite literally broke his arm and Illumi didn't even break a sweat. But if he does get serious, things get scary. As a manipulator, Illumi can do a bunch of crazy things. You see, Illumi can alter his appearance without needles. Basically, whatever he wants to look like, he can. However, by using needles, he's able to hold the form for longer. Illumi can also control corpses. If Illumi places multiple needles in the head of a corpse, he can control them just like he could with his needle people. These corpses can talk, drive, fight, do anything. But the thing that Illumi uses more than anything is needle people. Now, the control that Illumi has over needle people is usually less than corpse control. And this is because corpse control takes more needles and more time to set up. But with needle people, Illumi can basically just take one Nen imbued needle and shove it into somebody's head. This Nen is imbued with a somewhat basic command. Chase Kilowa, break things, run in circles. And these needle people will do that task until they either die or pass out from exhaustion. But if Illumi uses more needles, like two or three, these needle people can do more complex tasks like drive or speak. And if the fact that he can build an army of zombies at basically any point isn't scary enough, he's also Hisoka's boyfriend. So I wouldn't piss him off. His real relationship with Hisoka has never been like actually confirmed, but come on. But you know whose relationship is even more confusing than Hisoka and Illumi's? Silva's with Kilowa. And that's next on our list. Silva. Silva is the current head of the Zoltic family, the son of Zeno and the father of basically everyone else. Silva, just like his wife Kikyo, has love for Kilua and wants him to be an elite assassin. So much so that he named Kilua the next heir to the Zoltic family. You see, Silva might seem like the unproblematic king of the Zoltic family. But let's not forget that he was the person who told Illumi to put a needle in Kilua's brain. And also only let Kilua go out on his adventure with Gon because he saw it as a crucial step in Kilua becoming the heir to the Zoltic family. But Silva's terrified. Legitimately. He was once set out on a mission to kill a member of the Phantom Troop, and he did that. And upon killing this member of the Phantom Troop, Silva had to fight Crollo by himself. This is not the time that he fought Crollo with his father there, and this fight ended in a stalemate. And this makes sense because everything we've heard about Silva and everything we've seen from him is crazy. Kilua stated that he can rip a man's heart out of his chest without a singular drop of blood, which should just be impossible. That's where the blood is. It's the super highway of blood. He crushed Cheeto's head in one blow. That is a Chimera Ant Captain. 
Not to mention, Silva's body is so hardened that traditional blades can't cut it. And it's not even just his skin. His hair is so strong, it can be used as a tourniquet. But Silva, like Kilua, is a transmuter. And also like Kilua, he can transmute his aura and then emit it away from his body like Kilua's Thunderbolt. Except, uh... Silva's is a bit scarier. You see, Silva's transmission and emission ability are just called explosive orbs, and these explosive orbs are so powerful that they could kill Krolo and Zeno in one hit. That is to say that Zeno's plan was to hold Krolo down while Silva threw these explosive orbs at both of them, and that would kill both of them. The explosion is said to be able to level entire buildings in one go. And if big old explosive balls don't scare you, well, Silva is also a master enhancer, which makes sense because transmuters can use enhancement techniques at 80% efficiency. But enough about Silva, let's talk about his dad, Zenozoldic, a witty, angry man who wears a necklace that says one kill every day. You know, so you don't lose your edge. Zeno is through and through the strong old man stereotype. And honestly, if anything, he might be the unproblematic king of the Zoldic family. Zeno truly only really ever kills when he has a contract to do so, and while he shows no remorse for the people he's killing, that's still pretty good as far as Zoldics go. Also, he's big on not injuring innocents. We saw this when we saw his dragon descent actually injure Komogi, and upon realizing he had hurt an innocent, he lost all interest in the battle and basically just dipped. Now, was this due to the fact that this was the first time he ever hurt an innocent in his entire career and therefore he felt shame, or the fact that he's really, really dedicated to not injuring innocents. It could be both, but either way, that's a moral system, and as far as assassins go, that's pretty rare. But he's got a lot more than morals. He has an insane amount of strength. His durability is hilarious. He literally fell for two kilometers and landed like it was a two-foot jump. There's also the fact that Zeno is probably one of the best close-quarter fighters we've seen in all of Hunter x Hunter. He was able to put Krolo on the defensive, draw blood from Krolo, and hold Krolo down so that Silva could destroy the both of them. Zeno, just like Silva and Kilua, is a transmission. Muter. And just like with Silva, he's very talented in a mission, which is difficult as a transmuter because you're only able to use emission techniques at 60% efficiency, which is insane because some of his aura constructs can exist while they're kilometers away from him. Mind you, emission techniques get weaker as they're further from their host. And this is mostly due to the fact that Zeno is probably one of the most talented Nen users in all of Hunter Hunter's history. See, a master of Nen is able to create N that's about 50 meters around them. N, for those of you who don't remember, is a bubble of Nen you create around yourself so you can react to anything that comes within said bubble. That is a master of Nen. Zeno said he could go to 300 meters. That is roughly a thousand feet in all directions, 360. But how do his techniques manifest? Well, Zeno likes to transmute his aura into a dragon, specifically with an ability called Dragon Head. This makes his aura a tangible extension of his body that he can fire at opponents, and he can disconnect it from his body using his emission techniques and make it kind of like a dragon bullet. He can also use this ability to fly or have other people fly, which is insane. You see, with this Dragon Head ability, he not only flew him and Netero to the NGL, but he also flew Netero and Meroem a far enough distance away from the mansion in the NGL so their fight wouldn't hurt anybody, which is an emission technique used at a high level kilometers away from himself. He can then use Dragon Head to use two different abilities, Dragon Lance and Dragon Dive. Dragon Lance works a bit like Goku's Kamehameha Wave. Essentially, by launching his aura in the form of this dragon, he can control it with his hand. That is to say, he can precisely aim where it's gonna go and have it latch onto an opponent. And Dragon Dive is what happens when Zeno breaks up his dragon head into hundreds of little Nen dragon shards. These dragon shards destroyed almost everything in the Chimera Ant Palace and the outside walls. That is to say that this Dragon Dive acts like a mortar system that can cover almost a square mile. And while pro hunters and Chimera Ants can block these things or dodge them relatively easily against fodder, it's insanely powerful. But since we're talking insanely powerful, we now have to talk about some Zoldics that we assume are insanely powerful because of what they've been said to do. We don't really know their abilities or their backstories. So unfortunately, from here on out, we're beginning to venture into hypothetical territory. And since we're talking about Zeno, it's only appropriate that we talk about Zeno's father, Zig Zoldic. See, we know very and I mean very little about Zig Zoldic. In fact, we know more about Zig Zoldic's father than we know about Zig Zoldic. What we do know about Zig Zoldic, though, is the fact that he went to the Dark Continent, specifically with Netero while Netero was still young, and Zig Zoldic returned from the Dark Continent unharmed. See, going to the Dark Continent pretty much has a 99% mortality rate, and if you don't die there, you bring something horrific back with you. Specifically, every single excursion to the Dark Continent has brought back one of the five 
threats. These are incredibly terrifying diseases or monsters that return with the people who went to the dark continent and terrorize the V6 nations. I know it's the V5 nations, but like in the manga now it's V6. So the fact that Xenozoldic managed to return from the dark continent with Netero with no damage and none of the calamities speaks to an insane amount of power. Though I do technically have a theory that they were the expedition that brought back I, because that would explain how I ended up in Aluka. That is if you subscribe to the theory that Nanika is actually I, because instead of saying hi, which is Japanese for yes, she says I, which I think is an absolute banger of a theory and should probably agree with me. But for the purposes of this video, we're gonna assume that theory is not correct because it kind of dismantles my whole argument that they didn't come back with any of the calamities. Moving on, the next entry on our list is Zigzoldic's father, Maha. He's so old. Old. He's Kiloa's great, great, great grandfather. Wait, let me do the math. We got Kiloa, and then we have Silva, and then we have Zeno, and then we have Zig, and then we have Maha. Two greats, three greats, it's a lot of greats. I mean, this man is over 120 years old. And since he's 120 years old, that means that he's roughly the same age as Isaac Netero, the second strongest person in Hunter x Hunter. And a little caveat that we learned about Maha Zoldic is that the only person that he ever fought that survived was Isaac Netero. And that's how they worded it. Not the only person Maha ever lost to, not the person that ever gave Maha a good fight, the only person that ever fought Maha and survived was Isaac Netero. And not 120 year old Isaac Netero, prime power, full net abilities, Isaac Netero. A man who at 120 killed Meroem, sort of. Unfortunately, that's basically all we know about Maha Zoldic. That, and he's the only Zoldic who's primarily an enhancer, which would actually explain how long he's been alive. But also, enhancement is said to be the strongest of all the Nen affinities, outside of Specialist, obviously, which could explain the fact that he possibly beat Netero in a fight. But there is somebody who could beat Netero in a fight, and that's our last entry on this list. Yes, you guessed it, ladies and gentlemen. It's Alika. Well, actually, technically, it's not Alika, it's Nanika, because Alika herself doesn't have Nen. See, Alika herself is a very unassuming child. She's the second youngest child of the Zoldic family, and she loves her big brother, Kiloa. However, Alika shares a telepathic connection with an entity from the Dark Continent, which we assume to be I, one of the five calamities brought back through the V5 expeditions to the Dark Continent. However, because Alika technically shares a body with Nanika, she's got a couple of pretty weird abilities. See, Alika likes to ask people questions. They're more Alika likes to ask people to do things for her. And these questions can range from, hey, can you pick up that piece of gum for me to hand me your liver? Should a person accomplish three of these tasks, Alika will turn into Nanika and Nanika will grant said person a wish. Mind you, what these wishes can accomplish is said to possibly be boundless. Kilowa states that he's wished for all different kinds of things and he assumes that Nanika is able to grant quite literally any wish. The only problem with granting any kind of wish is that the more severe the wish Nanika grants, well, the worse it is for the next person who tries to get a wish. Let's say that hypothetically I complete three of Alika's requests, and then I wish for a billion dollars. The next person who tries to make a wish will have to complete some of Nanika's incredibly grueling asks, like pull out each one of your fingernails or give me your liver. But here's the thing, after you've completed one of Nanika's asks, well, you're in trouble. Because let's say the first ask isn't so bad. Maybe it's shave your beard. So I shave my beard. But the next ask is hand me your kidneys. If I say no to four tasks in a row, I die. But not only I die. You see, because depending on the severity of the wish prior to mine, people that I know and or people that I spend the most time with will die. If the wish prior to mine was something like give me a hug, then me and the person that I spend the most time with will die. However, if the wish before mine was something like give me a billion dollars, not only I, but everyone that I've known for even a small amount of time will get squished. Now there's a bunch of other rules that the Zoldics have painstakingly figured out with Alika, but I've already gone over all those rules in other videos, so I'm not going to go into it right now. Basically, all you need to know is that because Kilowa and Alika love each other so much, Kilowa is able to make requests of Alika and Nanika. That is to say that none of the rules apply to him, and Kilowa can basically ask Alika and Nanika for anything he wants. A billion dollars, Meroem dead, him and Gon to be best friends for the rest of their lives. Kill doesn't like to do this because he doesn't like to feel like he's using Alika. But that doesn't change the meat of what we're talking about here. Alika and Nanika have the ability to do anything. For all we know, Alika slash Nanika could collapse the star that keeps the planet Hunter Hunter is located on 
war. Alaka and Nanaka hypothetically could just delete existence. We don't know the bounds of what they can accomplish. And while technically this power is not something that they can manifest on their own, with the help of Kilawa, hypothetically, they can use Nanaka to accomplish anything. And because of that, Alaka is our unequivocal top spot. But what do you guys think? Do you guys feel as though I placed the Zoldix in their correct spots? Do you feel like certain Zoldix should be higher and or lower? Tell me in the comments below. And while you guys are there, please, for me, like this video, subscribe to the page and hit that noti bell. Listen, I'm not saying that there's never been a better time to learn Japanese, but we do get a new volume of Hunter Hunter on November 4th in Japanese. And the last time we got a new volume of Hunter Hunter in Japanese, it took 10 months for it to be translated into English. So get to studying.